Well, I'm looking at a small letter from the Apostle Peter this morning. Peter was at the end of his life. Somehow he knew, perhaps because he was in Roman captivity, somehow he knew that his days were severely numbered. And so as one who is at the end of his life, he writes to his churches. He writes as one who has been through so much. As we all know, Peter was the one who denied Christ. Peter's the one who stood out in the courtyard during his trial, and he was, in essence, put on trial by a little, by a little girl, a young woman, who put him on trial as Jesus was on trial upstairs, and he failed. Peter was the one, however, who also declared that, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's also the one who, after the example of Jesus, managed to walk on water, even if only for a moment. And then, of course, he, f he sank because of his failing faith. Peter was the one who had ups and downs, and we probably know more about Peter than all of the other disciples. But here he is anticipating the end. And this is what he shares. From the first, from first Peter in the first chapter. So think clearly. Exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do so you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. Through Christ you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, not to a life that, is, that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. The beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. Twice a year in the closing decade of my father's life, I made a point of going up and being with him. And so his birthday was the end of January. So every January I would take off and go up there and wasn't often able to do Christmas because I do Christmas. <laughs> and, uh, but January 25th was always a red letter day for me while dad was alive. And I saw at the end of his life what I thought to be some really beautiful tender behaviors, tender actions and choices that I had never noticed before. Dad was a civil engineer, so he was he had kind of that tough, he had a bit of a rough, tough exterior, and um, he saw things in a pretty much chain of command, or not chain of command, but chain of events sort of way. 
one thing leads to another and this and that. And very conservative. And, and yet, in the closing years, I watched Dad do some things that surprised me. So one day I was there and I was out with, with um, one of the kids and came back and, and there, was, there was Dad, he was just finishing up putting together a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he slapped it together. And then he was standing in the kitchen. Mom, has, Mom had died at this point. He was standing in the kitchen. And I saw, I saw him pause to pray before he took a bite. I thought about this just the other day because I was making myself a peanut butter sandwich. And I, as I was walking from the counter, I immediately took a bite and I thought of Dad pausing to pray before he took a bite. And then, late at night before he would go to bed, I'd see him go into the living room and his gnarled hands crippled from arthritis after his many years playing basketball and all the hits and, and damage that he did to his hands. I saw him praying in the living room. And I, this, this is what the end of my father's life looks like. This is, this is what it looks like when a man who has been faithful for all his years, this is what it looks like when he's at the end looking back. And that is a, a life that is characterized by, by prayer, humility, of a quietness before God, as he looks back, when, when he knows that his end is drawing near, he became quiet before God. Because that was for him, and it is for all of us, the single most significant, important reality of this existence. Nothing is greater. And so the apostle Peter, likewise, when he knows he is approaching his end, in his two letters, he, he recounts some of the most fundamental things, some of the stuff that really matters in life. And we have a hard time accepting that because we only see this life. We don't see what is beyond this. We see, as the apostle says, as through a glass dimly. We can't see beyond that boundary. So we have a tendency to hedge our bets. We, we kind of come back on this side and we, we make sure that everything is just so here. And very few of us go off and as far off seeking power and money and other things like, uh, like the Harvey Weinsteins of our world. But isn't that life exemplary of what the world teaches us is what happiness is all about? Now, yes, he got, he's gotten caught, and he is about to reap the whirlwind as one who has sown to the wind. But the, this, this ongoing hot pursuit, power, prestige, money, and of course all of those byproducts that, they, that, that some often think come with that. What does it yield? Is this life about the pursuit of happiness? Or is this life about the pursuit of holiness, of being in relationship with our God, of seeking what it means to know the fullness of life with him, and therefore to know the fullness of life as we live it. As Peter says, we are just 
foreigners in this land. We're, we're just passing through. We're aliens in this world. This is just a moment. But the life that awaits us lasts forever. And that this is an anticipatory life. This is a life that is to be lived in such a way that, that walks in the freedom that awaits us, that walks in the joy that awaits us. A dear couple in our church gave me this book that's been one of the most fabulous books I've read in a long time. It's called The Road to Character by David Brooks. He's a uh, columnist with the New York Times. I don't know his background. I don't know his faith. But I know his, his insights into human life and to the lives of so many is brilliant. But you know, I want to share with you a, a bit of a passage here. We don't live for happiness. We live for holiness. New York Times column writer. He's, he's an opinion writer. We, we just don't hear this kind of stuff from, from opinion writers out of any newspaper. We live for holiness. Day to day we seek out pleasure, but deep down human beings are endowed with moral imagination. All human beings seek to lead lives not just of pleasure, but of purpose, righteousness, and virtue. As John Stuart Mill put it, people have a responsibility to become more moral over time. The best life is oriented around the increasing excellence of the soul and is nourished by moral joy, the quiet sense of gratitude and tranquility that comes as a byproduct of successful moral struggle. The meaningful life is the same eternal thing, the combination of some set of ideals and some, and, and some man or woman's struggle for those ideals. Life is essentially a moral struggle not a hedonistic one. And yet so much of what we hear, so much of what is out there, so much of that which bombards us, that somehow life, and they would never call it a hedonistic struggle, but it's a struggle to get this and have that and enjoy this and have all these things. It's that old bumper sticker, the one with the most toys wins. And yet... The wisdom of the ages, the wisdom of the aged tells us that those things are so transient. They come and go so quickly. Jesus said, set your mind on the kingdom, not on the stuff that thieves can steal or that rust and moths can consume. It's so basic. We know this. And perhaps it is this reality of, of the loss that we have faced the possibility of that reminds us of how important is the real meaningful things of life, the stuff of life that, that constitutes the moral struggle of life. Sometimes it takes some age and experience to come to realize that. I was leafing through some channels the other day. I, I can't stand the fact that TV now has like 500 channels or something. I mean, who knows what to watch? I like watch like three or four channels and that's it. But I was leafing through, going from one thing to another, and I came upon a movie clip, and I think it was Robin Williams. It was a scene in which he was struggling with the fact that he was getting older and wasn't really accepting the fact that he was getting older. But he was trying to do something, and he kept spilling. He was unable to do it. His hands were shaking or whatever, and then suddenly he blows up. He gets extremely mad. He throws himself into a fit of rage because he's, he's gotten old. It's gotten old. I remember growing up, or actually before growing, beyond growing up, 
When I was in college, I had such a high jump. I, was, I could outjump anyone on the basketball team. And then I kind of thought, well, I'm going to test myself and keep going and see how long it is until I can't dunk a basketball anymore. And I was like 41 or 42. Couldn't do it. Go from a, a three-foot vertical to six-inch? <laughs> what is this? I didn't get mad. I just made an excuse for myself. Well, I haven't been working out or whatever. But the reality is, the reality is, it all, it all drains away for all of us. Physical, mental, emotional, but God willing. That which grows in us is that moral imagination. Now, out in that world, if you talk about morality, you get shouted down. Out in that world, you're going to hear, well, who's for you, who are you to say what's moral and what's not? The quiet soul before God simply seeks to know his will, to live in his way. And that, that posture is one of simple human humility. Now, I don't know of any of us who would call ourselves holy. I don't know of any of us who would. And and yet holy, all that all holy means is to be set apart. It means to be made unique, a per, to be a particular kind of people. Well, we may be that. We may be particular. We may be weird. Maybe unusual. But the term holy, we have taken on all these other connotations, but maybe it's enough. If we and in our own self-appraisal, can't call ourselves holy. Well, that's most appropriate. Because what our Lord teaches us is, even though we are not holy, even though we don't measure up, even though we are incapable of doing all those things that we want to do, that we strive to do, and we find ourselves sometimes doing them, but oftentimes not, oftentimes doing those very things that we know we shouldn't do, just like the Apostle Paul said, Maybe, if we're not holy, maybe humble is enough. Being humble before our God, being humble before one another, being humble in relationship to our own lives, our own bodies, our own frailties, being humble in this life with a broad but at times acute awareness of what our Lord has laid up for us, the great reward that he has stored up for all who would simply reach out to him and receive the gift that he has given. And be humble is enough. So we can call ourselves a humble people, loving one another, caring for the world that God also love so much. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh Lord, we fail so often. And, and yet in the midst of our failures, you continue to lavish so many gifts upon us. You give us your grace and your mercy. You also allow us to enjoy a magnificent and beautiful day we lavish in the touch of a loved one. We joy at the laughter of children. Lord, for these gifts, we are so unworthy. Nevertheless, we thank you. And we ask that we might be people ever more like your son. We ask this in his name. Amen.